Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on anaerobic soil disinfestation, a biological solution for the management of soil borne pests and pathogens in vegetable crop systems. My name is Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and this webinar will last approximately 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have about um, 15 to 30 minutes for questions. So today I'd like to welcome our presenters. We have Dr. Francesca Di Gioia, who is an assistant professor of vegetable crop science at the Pennsylvania State University, and he focuses on the development of sustainable vegetable production systems. Dr. Aaron Roskop is a research leader and research microbiologist at the USDA ARS U.S. Horticultural Research Laboratory in Fort Pierce, Florida. Her research focuses on alternatives to the use of chemical fumigants. So now I'm just going to hand over the presentation to Francesco Di Gioia, who will introduce today's webinar. Thank you, Alice, for the introduction, and uh, thanks everyone attending uh, today. Um, the, the title of the presentation is Anaerobic Soil Disinfestation, a Biological Solution for the Management of Soil-Borne Pests and Pathogens in Vegetable Crop Systems. And um, before we start, I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of information and background about the project that um, through which we are uh, conducting this uh, this webinar. Uh, the project is funded by the USDA NIFA OREI program, uh, which is uh, the Organic Research and Extension Initiative. And um, partner of the projects are uh, Penn State, that is the lead institution, and we have also Penn State Extension. Then we have the SDA RS, um, and in particular, the Horticultural Research Laboratory in Florida for peers, where uh, Dr. Roscoff is working and her team. Um, then um, the University of Florida and the extension, the IFAS Institute. And then we have also the participation of Oregon State University with Elise Formiga that um, is managing um, the, the e organic uh, web platform. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention about this project is that this is a multidisciplinary project and multi-regional project. We are working mainly in two regions, uh, the US Northeast, and in particular, we are working in Pennsylvania, and then the US Southeast, and we are working mainly in Florida. And in each of those regions, we are working with two, um, with two uh, cropping system, vegetable and strawberry organic systems. And as you can see from this um, layout of the project, we have different objectives that range from um, the optimization of ASD uh, and integration in organic uh, vegetable and strawberry cropping system to uh, understanding the impact of ASD on the soil microbiome and the nutrient dynamics, the efficacy in controlling specific pests and pathogens, soil-borne pests and pathogens, and then um, we have also within this project, we are evaluating the economic viability of ASD and um, an objective, a big component of the project is to transfer this technology to growers. So we are working through extension educators like on farm and um, using the e-organic web platform, we are uh, organizing this webinar and we um, are you know providing all the resources that you can you can follow on the website um, for the presentation today the main objective of this presentation is to provide like an introduction on asd and overall um, introduction and so we'll talk a little bit about the history of asd how it was developed then we will talk about the application method and the principle the mechanism, a little bit of the mechanism on, um, you know, of disease and um, like pest suppression. Um, and then Dr. Erin Roscoff will talk about the development and optimization of ASD in Florida. And I will talk again later um, to um, present the work that we have done to implement ASD in Pennsylvania. Um, one, um, one important thing that, um, I would like to mention here is the fact that um, there is a, an important connection between soil borne pest management and soil health. And you know, there are many definitions of soil health. One that I like really a lot is this one that is very popular and um, 
you know, it defines soil health as the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living system. And um, often, especially in the past, the soil has been described as an heterogeneous mix of three components, three phases. One is the solid, the other one is the liquid, and then the gas uh, phase. And um, one thing that you know we um, really need to um, give importance to, and that we are discovering every day with you know uh, the availability of the research tool that we have now, uh, is the the biological living component that is constituted by a series of you know microorganisms, animals that live in the soil, and that have an important, very important fac function in terms of you know improving soil health. They affect a lot of um, you know, uh, different properties of the soil, including they have also like an important role in the suppression of soil-borne pests and pathogens. And so, you know, um, I'm mentioning this because a lot of the approach, the biological approach to uh, the management of soil-borne pests and pathogens um, really are, are considering the impact on soil health and um, ASD is, is one of those. Um, if we look at the integrate pest management uh, pyramid, um, you know, we have different options when it comes to managing soil-borne pests and pathogens. One is the prevention or exclusion of the pathogens that is not always like practicable. Um, then we have cultural practices and those include like crop rotation, uh, the use of cover crops, organic amendments, the use of um, like conservative tillage practices, as well as the use of resistant varieties or resistant rootstocks. Um, then we have physical methods, and those include soil solarization, soil floating, soil steaming. And um, you know, what we are going to talk today about are, you know, is, is like within fits within the biological method, biological approaches. And we're going to talk specifically about anaerobic soil disinfestation, but then there are also other approaches that you know are bi are considered biological. And the last you know strategy or approach is the use of chemicals. And when we talk about soil-borne pests and pathogens, um, it's you know one thing that has been used a lot in the past and is still used today is chemical fumigation, chemigation. Um, but we want to reduce the use of chemical as much as possible. Um, if, if we look at you know, what was happening in the past, a lot of the specialty crop systems were using metal bromide as a broad spectrum uh, fumigant to control soil borne pested pathogen. It was um, effective, but at the same time, it was dangerous for human health and it was dangerous for the environment being one of the uh, compounds responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer. And what you see here are a few pictures of the Antarctic ozone all um, over, over time. Um, so with the phase out of metal bromide, it was phase out because of these issues. Um, you know, a lot of research started on alternative to chemical fumigation, alternative to metal bromide. And ASD and other biological approaches have been developed a lot more after metal bromide has been phased out. In the case of anaerobic soil disinfestation, um, um, it was developed simultaneously and independently in Japan and the Netherlands. So we are going to go now a little bit in the history of um, how the method was uh, developed. Uh, in the Netherlands, around um, during the World War II, there was a big flooding that um, affected an entire region that I cannot pronounce, but you see written here. And this flooding lasted for almost two years. And after, right after this flooding, a lot of the uh, growers that were growing like tulips and other ornamental crops, and before the flooding had a lot of issue with you know, nematodes and other soil-borne pests and pathogen, they realized that for a few years after the flooding, they were not having those issues. And so they started working with Wageningen University and they understood that, you know, they tried to replicate the floating and they, um, that they had, you know, uh, that was caused during World War II. And um, what they saw is that, you know, with eight, 12 weeks of floating, they could control nematodes pretty well. And so they started, you know, studying this technology. 
at the same time in Japan, um, they have been using for uh, you know centuries these paddy upland uh, field rotation systems, and they notice the same thing that after like the field were floated because of the rice production, then there were some advantages in terms of soil health and uh, pathogen control uh, with the, when they did wheat production, for example, on uh, dry land. Uh, during this time, there was also a lot of research on the use of organic amendment for disease and pathogen, uh, soil-borne pest and pathogen suppression, and uh, also on soil solarization. And soil solarization was studied mainly in um, like the Mediterranean area or in California where we have semi-arid condition. One, one thing that happened uh, is that researchers that were working in different parts of the world on this different uh, primitive technique of you know, management of soil-borne pest and pathogens started combining, for example, the soil solarization with organic amendment or floating with organic amendment. And they saw that those like the combination of the two was more effective. So in this in this slide here, um, I, I kind of want to summarize what happened like in terms of evolution of different management approaches. And we can say organic amendment has been used for centuries. It's kind of, you know, um, a method to improve in general soil health. And that has an impact also on uh, pest, soil-borne pests and pathogens. And as I mentioned, you know, different groups were working on soil solarization and soil floating, and they started combining each method with the organic amendment. And so combining soil solarization with organic amendment, the biosolarization method uh, was developed. And then um, combining the principle of floating, so soil saturation, tarping of the soil with clear or opaque uh, film, and um, the, the application of organic amendment led to the development of anaerobic uh, soil disinfestation. And um, one thing that we can say is that, you know, with the development of this technology, the time of application changed, decreased a lot. For example, we can apply ASD for only two or three weeks while soil floating or soil solarization required from six to, you know, 12 weeks. Uh, so the application time has reduced. At the same time, the efficacy in controlling soil-borne pests and pathogens increased with, you know, the more, um, you know, the most evolved uh, approaches. And one thing that we can say is a difference between biosolarization and anaerobic soil disinfestation is the dependence on temperature, on high temperature. And anaerobic soil disinfestation is less dependent on high temperature, and so it can be applied also in regions that do not have you know, uh, relatively high temperature, like, you know, the Mediterranean area or uh, semi-arid uh, region. So um, here, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how ASD is applied. Uh, the first, so ASD is usually applied in three steps. The first step is to incorporate in the soil an organic amendment that is uh, readily available for, um, for the microbes. And so it's like, you know, we are providing sugar to activate the microbes in the soil. And then the other component is to mulch the soil, tarp the soil with an impermeable uh, film, and that will help develop anaerobic conditions um, very, you know, very quickly in the soil. And the other component is soil saturation. So we irrigate the soil to uh, achieve like, you know, soil saturation. That doesn't mean floating, but really it means like, you know, to have the soil wet because microbes will need water. And also that water in the soil will help the distribution of byproducts that are the active ingredients that, you know, allow the, 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 the suppression of pests and pathogens. Um, in this slide here, I just want to show a little bit of a graphic. Um, so, you know, if we have our soil, we amend the soil with a carbon source, we need to consider that that carbon source usually has also other nutrients and in particular, in particular nitrogen. We want to incorporate that carbon source within the root zone and um, then, you know, mulch the, the soil with the, an impermeable film. Usually, you know, the best option is to use totally impermeable film that limits the gas exchanges, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the exchange of oxygen in, between the soil and the atmosphere. And then we irrigate to saturation. And once we do this, 
what happens is that there is a rapid development of anaerobic conditions, and the 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 microbes start feeding on the on the carbon, and they kind of develop a process that is like similar to a fermentation process. And what we have is that the the soluble sugar is um, I don't know why this is not showing here, but the soluble sugar is transformed into organic acids. And um, those organic acids uh, are part of the active ingredients. And beside organic acids, we have also volatile organic compounds uh, that are suppressive for soil borne pathogens. Then we also have uh, some you know, effects on the nitrogen. And we are not going to talk much today about the nitrogen, but you know, a potential factor is also the generation of ammonia in the suppression of soil borne pathogens. Um, we have done several tests and, um, you know, analyzing the organic acid content, we see that in proportion to the application rate of the carbon source that we use, we have, you know, a higher production of organic acids. But, you know, there is also research conducted by Dr. Roscoff um, showing that, you know, and, and other colleagues as well, showing that organic acids do not explain the efficacy of ASD and there are other other mechanisms that are involved with this. And, you know, one of the mechanisms is the biological control by facultative anaerobic microorganisms. Um, then, you know, there is also the component of low pH, low oxygen, uh, the potential generation of ammonia when we have a high nitrogen source and high pH. Uh, also, there is demonstration of sulfur compounds and, you know, other uh, antimicrobial uh, compounds including the generation of reduced iron and manganese ions. And, you know, the most likely is the combination of all these factors, this mechanism that is leading to the suppression of pests and pathogens. So it's a pretty complex system, but, you know, um, it's very interesting, very fasc fascinating. I'm going to stop here uh, with the introduction, and I will let Dr. Uh, Roscoff to share her presentation. So the portion I'd like to share with you now is how we evolved uh, to be working very intensely on anaerobic soil dis disinfestation in Florida. Here we have a great deal of production that was dependent upon uh, methyl bromide, including tomatoes, peppers, and strawberries, primarily in our state. Um, and we began working on looking at more sustainable measures as a result of the potential for growers to lose even more registered materials. So there were a few of us who had this sustainability uh, component in the back of our minds, not only from an environmental perspective, but also from the perspective of wanting to give growers tools that were not dependent upon the pesticide industry to provide them. So we began working on alternative uh, production systems. And this is an example of one of those where we were using rotational crops and then uh, tilling them in. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a no-till system. So they were just flail mode and we were using uh, iron clay pea, sun hemp, and then a straight uh, solarization treatment that would last between 56 and 65 days. And then this clear plastic had to be removed and polyethylene mulch uh, put over top of those beds, because here in Florida, if we leave the clear UV stabilized uh, solarization film, it's too hot for us to grow crops. So we either had to find a water soluble paint to cover those or replace it with another polyethylene mulch. So we had some really great results from this. As this is an example um, of some of the work, the results from the work. In the first case, you can see that solarization really resulted in pretty high marketable yields. And this, in this case, is only about 15% less than a conventional uh, production of peppers in the same year. Um, but we could also see that plastic mulch itself also gave us that kind of yield when it was incorporated uh, with urban plant debris that had been composted. The most important thing we probably learned from this is that a no-till system here in Florida with those crops is not a functional system. We really um, ended up with much too much competition uh, from remaining crop uh, growth from the cover crops and turned our, our interest more to solarization at that time. 
So our next experiment, which probably was a little out of control, going from uh, small plots, relatively small plots on a farm, to leasing 11 acres um, from a conventional tomato grower, where we took different approaches to transition to an organic system, um, starting out with a previously fumigated soil background. So we used a bahia grass strip uh, fallow, um, to which we uh, planted back tomatoes after the bahia grass was harvested. We had a disc fallow that went on for several years prior to planting the last crop organic, which was a regular um, it was regular input of organic amendments and a weed fallow. So this went on for five years and then we grew the tomato, except in the conventional system, which was back to back tomato, we grew tomatoes in the last year. And what we found in this situation was that uh, we had an enormous amount of weeds that grew in the Bahia strip till as well as in the weed fallow. We expected the weed fallow to be able to suppress uh, nuts edges as a result of competition, but that really didn't work out. We also got excellent control of uh, fusarium wilt. What we did find was that solarization and the biosolarization based systems were effective for weed and disease control, but they were not effective for nematode suppression. And that is primarily because the nematodes will move down throughout the season and the solarization and biosolarization approaches were not adequate for reaching um, enough uh, lethal temperature at the lower uh, soil partitions. The other aspect that we figured out was that solarization in Florida is highly dependent upon having an extended period of time without rain events. And during the period where we would uh, implement soil solarization, it rains almost daily. So that was also another issue for us to um, be able to really have confidence in a consistent result from the soil solarization approaches. Around this time, I learned about anaerobic soil disinfestation, which was called biological soil disinfestation at the time. We had some wonderful cooperators that began with us uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Arena Van Bruggen, Joji Morimoto, and Carol Shannon from the University of California. And then one of the originators of the uh, approach in Japan, Noriaki Moma and his former supervisor, Yuso Kabara. So they were able to come and give us some advice about how to begin doing ASD. And for us, all of our targets were those that had been previously controlled by soil fumigation. fumigation. So we were looking at Phytophthora, Fusarium, Ralstonia, Sclerotium ralsii, Macrophemina, root knot nematodes, and specifically at uh, nut sedges, which for us in every crop are a problem coming through the plastic. So our first experiments in ASD looked at whether or not we could do this process with no additional water, two acre inches of water, or four acre inches of water. And then we either included composted uh, poultry litter or no nitrogen amendment, and then molasses with or without. And in this particular experiment, the treatments were applied using a clear uh, UV stabilized solarization film. What we found is that each pest category really had a uh, one of the amendments or one of the practices was really directed at its control. So for example, for Fusarium oxysporum, molasses was the most significant portion of that treatment. And you can see this is excellent control of Fusarium oxysporum, uh, well below the methyl bromide standard. And that uh, when we had no additional molasses, we got <clears throat> poor control. With regard to plant parasitic nematodes, we have quite a population of uh, root knot nematode here. We looked at the same experiment and found that it was really the initial irrigation that was most important for the control of nematodes. So this is the um, no irrigation. You can see we ha had very little control and then two inches of irrigation and four inches of irrigation. When it was solarization alone, we got poor control of the root knot nematodes, but any one of those inputs had an impact on that population. 
with weeds, we could use two or four inches of initial irrigation, but one of the most important components for this was the combination of molasses and the nitrogen source. So a picture is worth a thousand words. You can see here are two examples of untreated checks where the grass weeds are completely out of control. Uh, this is the um, ASD treated plot. This is a methyl bromide treated plot in this particular experiment. And you can see that weed control using ASD for particularly grass weeds coming up in the planting hole was absolutely excellent. But one of the most important things that we learned in our on-farm trials at this point was that solarization as a requirement was unacceptable to our growers. And so one of our goals was to determine if we could just conduct ASD underneath a, a regular high density polyethylene film. And our, in our first trials, we tried a solarization film that was a standard um, high density polyethylene, an opaque high density polyethylene, a virtually impermeable film, which was the first generation of gas impermeable films, as well as a totally impermeable film, which is differentiated from the VIF film by having a, a layer of EVOH in between the two layers of polyethylene. And what we found is that we could eliminate the solarization component if we use the TIF um, that was opaque. This is a white, totally impermeable film. This is what the nuts edge population looks like when you use high density polyethylene. So then we looked at some additional components of using, using different types of plastic. And in this case, we incorporated a number of um, amendment treatments as well as four different types of, of polyethylene film. And what we found is that uh, the number of hours of cumulative um, anaerobicity are shown here, and that's how we measure whether or not we've gotten a good ASD treatment. Our target is really a minimum of 50,000 uh, millivolt hours, but what we can see here is that with solarization, we were meeting that 50,000 threshold, but with the TIF, with the SAGE treatments, we're having as many as five times that threshold in terms of millivolt hours um, of anaerobic conditions. And in this particular field, our biggest um, pathogen problem was Phytophthora capsaicae. And this is not a great deal of disease because it was a quarter acre plot, but we do see about 8% um, Phytophthora capsaicae causing death in those plants and about 2% in any of the treatments that included the very high levels of um, TIF and ASD. One of the next things that we wanted to do based on some greenhouse and grow chamber studies was to look at if we had low soil temperatures, if we incorporated more carbon, could we still provide the same level of control? So this was in a, in a tomato cropping system. And we started really adding what we were looking at in terms of uh, perfecting our approaches to ASD applications. So we always monitor the level of anaerobicity, soil temperature. We started looking at nitrous oxide emissions because any manure-based system is typically associated with that greenhouse gas, as well as soil nutrient solution collection to determine if we have the potential for leaching any nitrates. And we'll talk more about that component in another follow-up webinar. So we also assessed all of the uh, pathogen control, fruit yield, and started looking at, at quality as well. In this application, uh, we were looking at what we considered our standard approach to ASD, which was referred to as ASD1 here, which incorporates the composted poultry litter and a, a single, what we considered a single rate of molasses, and an ASD2, which doubled both of those components. What we found, uh, first reflected in root gall ratings by Meloidogyne incognita in this location, was that ASD1, that single rate of inputs, was adequate for uh, root knot nematode control. And we did not see a benefit from doubling those materials. So then we wanted to see the opposite direction in the fall when the soil is a bit warmer and we cut our standard treatment in half of both the composted poultry litter and the molasses. 
And this also resulted in excellent uh, nematode control as well as excellent marketable yield. And so as you can see here, this organic system that's based on a half rate of ASD uh, was equivalent to a uh, conventional fumigant based system in terms of the yield. And then from this, we had enough field trials that we could actually look at the economics of the system. And you'll see in two cases, compared to the conventional soil fumigant, we had lower returns because of the uh, amount of the cost of the inputs at these two locations. But in every other case, we had a positive economic benefit from utilizing ASD when compared to soil fumigation. So one of the things that we were really interested in looking at is can we make ASD even more sustainable? So we started looking at biodegradable mulches and we did have a relatively high level of anaerobicity. Um, this is with our TAF and then with our uh, biomulch coming in second, although this is not statistically significantly different. But what we did find is that with the biomulches, we got re really no control of nut sedge. And in fact, it began coming up in the beds you can see here on the right and um, really impacted the integrity of the film. This is also particularly difficult film to um, apply using conventional raised bed uh, plastic mulch equipment. So we, we were still concerned about this because it still results in a good deal of um, plastic waste. And so what we were able to do is then conduct some experiments in which we use silage tarp, a four mil silage tarp instead of the totally impermeable film and really got excellent results using this film that, that are comparable to using a totally impermeable film, except that they can be used repeatedly um, in multiple cropping systems instead of being disposed of. So this is where we started looking at uh, silage tarps on with some on-farm evaluations. And one of those was in a carrot farm and using the silage tarp, we achieved nice thresholds of uh, anaerobicity. And it ended up in a marketable carrot yield for this organic grower that exceeded what he had typically been using. Then we moved into strawberries and here our pathogen groups are a little bit different. Uh, we have a couple of broadleaf weeds that are a significant problem, sting nematodes and charcoal rot, which is a relatively new pathogen for us in Florida strawberries. And we wanted to see if we could apply just organic acids and compare that to a treatment with ASD. And what we see here is that the organic acids did not provide the control of macrophemina that anaerobic soil disinfestation did. In fact, in this situation where we started out once again with solarization plastic, we got excellent control of macrophemina, as well as in the right in the box, you can see um, sting nematodes, root knot nematodes, and other um, plant parasitic nematodes. So we wanted to work a bit more in strawberries so that we could determine if there were other nitrogen and carbon inputs that we could utilize. And then we were able to do some on-farm um, trials, which were actually were demonstrations where we went to the portions of strawberry fields where um, fumigants couldn't be applied. So in the buffer zones, as well as in another location um, in which they got no control of macrophemina, macrophemina using the inputs, the chemical inputs that they had used previously. So this, we were able to use some existing equipment, um, just a, a compost spreader, and then we formed the false beds using the compost spreader, incorporate the nitrogen source, apply the molasses, reform the beds, and club, cover with that totally impermeable film. And we've got really excellent control of weeds and macrophemina in a grower applied ASD approach. And then in this organic system, we got no control of 
root of nutsedge. And what we found in this was that an inadequate amount of water had actually been applied. So we didn't really get soil saturation. Um, and the nutsedge appreciated that extra nitrogen. So we still have some things to work out um, and, and ensuring that our growers are utilizing the amount of water that we recommend. So our current ASD questions in particularly in organic strawberry is how do we improve those two um, recalcitrant pests, the macrophemina and the nutsedge without having to use clear plastic film. We like to look at other carbon sources and reduce the nitrogen inputs because we got quite a bit of vegetative growth the first time that we went into an organic uh, production system and improve the quality of ASD produced berries. Our grower cooperator found that his berries were equivalent to his fumigation um, based berries in terms of quality, size, color, and flavor, uh, but that is not always the case. So that is one item that we will continue to work on. So in Florida, these are the pathogens that we have been able to effectively control. Um, those that I've mentioned here and uh, macrophemina, we think requires higher temperature for control and nutsedge continues to be one of our targets. So that's where we are in Florida. I'd like to acknowledge a large number of cooperators that have worked with us uh, throughout our ASD adventure since 2008, as well as the folks I consider to be my dream team, uh, all the folks that help us do all of this monitoring and setting out of all of our uh, experiments work with our cooperators. I think we're back to you, Francesco. Thank you, Erin. I'm gonna share again my screen. So yeah, in this in this uh, third part, um, I would like to talk about the implementation of uh, ASD in Pennsylvania. And um, I, I will mention that a lot of the work that has been done in the past, like on ASD, like um, except for you know the Netherlands, has been like in warmer region. And um, when I started working at Penn State in 2018, one of the questions that we had is, you know, can we apply ASD in the Northeast region? And um, one thing that I would like to mention is that in this uh, region, we see an increased adoption of protected culture system, in particular, uh, eye tunnels. And, you know, there are many reasons uh, for which like eye tunnels are used. Um, you know, they are used as a growing season extension tool provide better control of the environment and higher yield and quality of the produce. But at the same time, um, especially if we do, you know, um, intensive cultivation uh, and monoculture with, you know, the, the crop that provide higher revenue, we see that easily we can have um, the development of soil-borne pest and pathogen issues or in general soil health issues. Now in an organic production system, you know, we should always have crop rotation, but still um, we may have, we may encounter some of those pathogens. And, you know, through various surveys that have been conducted, especially uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Beth Gugino lab uh, here at Penn State and, um, you know, they have been doing surveys in iTunnel. There is a, a set of pests and um, pathogens that, you know, are soil borne and that include like Fusarium wheel, Fusarium crown and root rot. Um, lately, we are seeing also southern, like southern blight, verticillium wheel and corky root rot. And one thing that, you know, it was not, it is not a, a major problem in uh, open field, but it's becoming a big issue in eye tunnel is root knot nematode that you see here in the picture. Um, so, you know, I started working in Pennsylvania in 2019, in 2018, and um, after, you know, working with Dr. Roscoff in Florida on uh, the, the approaches, the approach um, that she described, like working with different trials and, the main question was, you know, can we apply ASD at relatively lower temperature as those that we have in Pennsylvania and the Northeast region? Um, and, you know, one thing that we know from our research is that all three components, the carbon source, the organic amendment that we apply, the mulching, um, the type of plastic as Dr. Roscoff showed really well, and also the initial 
amount of water that we apply for the irrigation are very important for um, you know for the success of the SD treatment. But all of this is affected also by the environmental conditions. So you know the, the soil type, the temperature that we have, and you know together. The, the treatment and the environmental condition contribute to determine, you know, the level of anaerobicity that we achieve, the pH in the soil, the moisture content, the, you know, the availability of nutrients after the treatment. And all this is kind of mediated by the soil microbial community. So it's, it's very important for us also to understand how microbes are reacting to the inputs that we provide. And this is determining you know, the, the, the management of soil borne pests and pathogens, as well as the nutrient dynamics, and finally, the crop health. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we, um, we, we wanted to assess is like, what is the best timing of application for ASD? When can we apply ASD in Pennsylvania and in the Mid-Atlantic region? And, uh, you know, looking at the temperature of the soil in high tunnels, um, we know that, you know, microbial activity is substantially reduced when we go below 60 uh, Fahrenheit, which correspond to 15.5 Celsius. And uh, microbial activity is really important for this treatment. So we, we don't need to achieve like high temperature like in the soil solarization, but we still need some microbial activity. And so the best window of time that we have to apply ASD usually is between April and the end of September, I will say mid-October in Pennsylvania, depending on where we are. And, and so this is also like the window where we have the production of tomatoes. And so we can apply ASD essentially after an early tomato planting. So um, between the end of August and mid-October, or we can apply ASD in the spring before a late tomato planting. And this is, so I'm taking tomato as a reference crop because it's kind of the main crop, but um, this, these are the two main windows where we can apply ASD and this is in theory. And so we wanted to verify this um, with our experiment. The other thing that, you know, whenever you are introducing ASD to a new environment, the main you know, factor that you need to determine is what carbon source is available, what can I use as a carbon source? And you know, it, it, it is important that the carbon source that we use is you know, the organic amendment is available locally, it is a low cost, and that it has physical, chemical, and microbial properties that you know, are suitable for ASD. Um, and then, you know, we are always considering, of course, the impact on soil borne pests and pathogens because that is our primary um, goal there. But at the same time, we are interested in uh, looking at the impact of those car carbon sources and organic amendment on nutrient dynamics and also on the crop performance afterwards, as well as on, you know, the environment, like, you know, if we control the pathogens, but we are impacting the environment, that is also not sustainable, not viable. So the first set of experiments that we did, we focused mainly on cover crops. And we did this uh, through a pot experiment. We tested um, 11 different, uh, 12 actually, um, different uh, cover crops. And one of those was not uh, effective. And so they became 11. And we compared those core those cover crops to um, molasses, um, considering it as a, as a standard um, carbon source. So this was a pot study in which we were assessing like the biomass production, how much we can produce in uh, 30 days or in 46 days. And um, then, you know, we use the biomass produced at 46 days to actually implement the ASD treatment. And this is the level of soil anaerobicity that we achieved. So we measure it through this re uh, soil redox potential uh, parameter. And what you can see from this graph is that there was not major difference between the cover crops that we used. And the, other, the only one, the only treatment that was really going down in terms of anaerobicity was molasses. Um, and you know, doing an analysis of the data, what we realized is that, um, so this is like, you know, while this graph is showing the trend of the soil redox potential, the anaerobicity, this graph here is showing the cumulative anaerobicity that we achieved. And what we can see here is that 
all the cover crops were had much lower cumulative uh, redox potential compared to uh, molasses. And you know, if we analyze all the factors that contribute to that, the main thing is that the total carbon applied was much higher with the molasses, with the standard rate of molasses compared to the cover crop. Now, among the cover crop, we identify buckwheat as the best option. And, um, you know, we did follow up tests. Now, beside the cumulative redox potential, what you can see in this graph is also the total organic acids that were detected, that were measured at different timing uh, during the SD treatment. So this is one day, four days, seven days, 14 and 28 days after the uh, treatment application. And you can see also here that molasses generated much more um, organic acid. So that's still explaining um, you know, why we, we had those results. Now, in, in this experiment, we also started analyzing um, the composition of you know, the, the, the carbon sources. And one thing that we realized is that you know, it's not just enough the, the total carbon. We, we cannot consider just the total carbon, but really what is important is the fraction of carbon that is mostly available for microbes. And so what we saw is that the easily oxidizable carbon or the total sugar content of our carbon source are a very important factor. Um, now, using buckwheat, um, you know, we, we, we did more tests in the field. So from pot, we went to uh, test, we tested different cover crops in, at field scale. And then we implemented a, a, a first experiment. Um, this was done like in August of 20, 2019, uh, in which we compared buckwheat applied by itself or uh, combined with molasses and it was compared with molasses and the untreated check. Now all the treatments received, um, you know, um, a portion of uh, pelleted chicken manure as a nitrogen source. And through this experiment, what we saw is that um, buckwheat by itself and buckwheat plus molasses uh, achieved pretty good anaerobic conditions. In this case, we were also testing clear and black uh, TIF film. Um, and, you know, the only treatment that were not uh, achieving anaerobic conditions, enough anaerobic condition were the treatments that um, didn't receive any amendment. But still, what we saw here is that molasses by itself at full rate, it was like it provided like a prolonged uh, anaerobicity uh, compared to, you know, when we used buckwheat or buckwheat uh, plus uh, molasses. And um, this is the graph showing the cumulative redox potential. And what we can see here is that clearly ASD, the molasses was more effective than the combination of um, buckwheat by itself or buckwheat and molasses. And, um, and so this is just telling us that, you know, the, 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 the cover crops can contribute to determine, like could be a good, can sub substitute in part um, um, a carbon source like molasses, but still, uh, are not as effective as molasses. And this was the case for both black and clear TIF. Now, the next step was to look at other carbon sources. And we looked at what is available through, you know, as a byproduct, as a, as a waste um, through different agri-food industry in Pennsylvania. This was part of uh, a master um, thesis done by Raymond Balaguer. Um, and um, what we looked at, was like uh, edamame residue from uh, a facility that is like in central Pennsylvania. We looked at wheat middlings uh, that is also available um, in Pennsylvania and then spent mushroom compost that is you know, widely available in PA. And the other thing that we tested was spent um, brewery grain that is available, you know, everywhere, I was saying the US in small quantity, relatively small quantity, sometimes in large quantities. So what we did was we tested all these alternative carbon sources with a, a fall application. And this was like done in September of 14 in central Pennsylvania. This is kind of, um, you know, in the middle, like is in the fall and this kind of, uh, one of the latest windows of time where we can apply ASD. So here you see the mini plot that we used 
um, in a movable light tunnel system. And this is the SOAR redox potential again. And what you can see is that we achieved pretty good anaerobic conditions, especially with molasses that was used as a standard and wheat middlings. Actually, wheat middlings was even better than molasses. Um, the other treatment achieved anaerobic condition, that, but they were like inconsistent. Um, and, you know, the particularity of this experiment was that we did this treatment while we had temperature that were very close to the 15 to the 60 Fahrenheit uh, temperature or 15.5 Celsius. And again, this is like, you know, below the 15 is kind of um, the limit that we have where the microbial activity is, is reduced substantially. And if we look at, you know, the, the entire, um, like the, the cropping system, we, after applying the ASD treatment here, we planted lettuce and that was covered with the eye tunnel. And then we had tomatoes afterward. But what I want to show here is that, you know, the, that window of time in which we used, that we applied the ASD treatment was kind of the last window. And then the temperature really dropped, even if the soil was covered with the eye tunnel. The other thing that we wanted to test was if we could apply SD over the spring. And this was a trial that we did in 2022 using, again, different carbon sources. And those carbon sources were characterized by um, different CN ratio. So the, the, the content of carbon and nitrogen is what is determining the CN ratio. And usually we say that, you know, ideally we want a CN ratio between 30 to 1 and 20 to 1. Uh, but here we have also like carbon sources like soybean meal that have much lower um, CN ratio. And we always use like chicken manure as a, as a source of nitrogen. Um, in this experiment, what I want to show you here is just, you know, uh, we were planting tomatoes like on uh, May 9th. And um, this was the temperature. Um, this is the soil redox potential that we have after those treatments. And what we see here is, again, that all the treatments that were amended with organic, uh, you know, with organic, with carbon sources, which achieved pretty good anaerobicity level. And molasses was the one that achieved like anaerobicity for, you know, a longer period. So molasses is distinguishing itself always for, you know, this longer anaerobicity period. Um, the temperature that we had during this, um, sorry for the move of the slide, but um, it was like, you know, generally we were like, again, borderline between that 15 Celsius and higher temperature. So these were relatively low temperature um, also in this case. Now, one thing that we saw here because we were working with different CN ratios is that monitoring the crop, plant growth and the nutritional status and monitoring what was happening in the soil, we saw that the treatments that were uh, more anaerobic and did and had a higher CN ratio, meaning they had more carbon than nitrogen, um, reduced the availability of nitrogen over time. And this is something that, you know, we're not going to talk much about today, but it's very important to mention that another aspect that um, is important in selecting the carbon source is really the CN ratio. Uh, and the reason for that is because microbe diet um, is really ideally should be 20 to 1. And if we have lower, like more carbon and less nitrogen available, then the carbon source will be less labile. When, when we have more nitrogen, nitrogen is not a limiting factor and we, we can, um, we have, you know, more easily uh, digestible carbon source. Um, now, with this, I just wanted to provide some conclusion um, saying that, you know, it is possible to apply ASD in Pennsylvania in the Mid-Atlantic region in the fall and the spring season. Of course, we can apply it also over the summer because it's when we have higher temperature. We learned from the studies done in Florida as well as the study done in Pennsylvania that the quality and the quantity of carbon that we apply are really key for the success, the efficacy of the treatment, but also for a lot of different things like, you know, the availability of nutrients afterwards. 
it, it is possible to integrate cover crops and organic amendment, and that probably is one way to reduce the cost of the treatment. But you know, selecting the cover crops and the organic amendment is still something that we need to work on. And in in that in that sense, it's very important to um, consider the effect in terms of CN ratio. And we know that more research is needed also to assess what is happening in terms of soil microbiome. Now, currently, what we are doing through the OREI research project is, for example, to compare different cover crop mixes uh, that have a different CN ratio. So we are comparing, for example, the effect of triticale that has uh, you know, more carbon than nitrogen, Pimson clover, which is a leguminose fixing nitrogen, and that has more availability of nitrogen and the mix of the two. And we are combining this with, with midlings. And here is a few pictures from the last experiment that we did. And we see that that CN ratio, the amount of carbon that is applied, the amount of biomass generated through the uh, cover crops are all factors in determining uh, how much anaerobicity we achieved. And we know that that is linked to um, the efficacy of the treatment in controlling soil-borne pests and pathogens. We are doing the work in open field as well as in eye tunnel, as you can see in these pictures. And with that, I will say like, you know, we are trying to do a lot of um, uh, extension work, outreach activities. And I will invite you, I, I would like to invite you to follow our webpage on the eOrganic uh, platform. We are going to do more webinars, more specific, going more specific, um, like in depth, like uh, to talk about carbon sources, CN ratio, uh, the impact on microbes, and things like that. I also, you know, would like to acknowledge um, uh, my team. Uh, it, it, without, you know, the help of a lot of people uh, that have been working on these projects, like. Uh, we couldn't do this work. And beside the, 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 the member of my lab, also the members of other labs that work uh, in conjunction, in coordination with us on this project. Um, and then I would like to thank all our funding sources and in particular the USDA NIFA OREI program. Um, with that, I, I'm done with the presentation and I hope that we have time for questions. Yeah, what are your thoughts about the economics of anaerobic soil disinfestation? Well, I will be happy to answer that. In the studies that we've had enough field trials uh, to conduct a, a thorough and correct economic analysis, typically what it, it is an added cost for the labor to put out anaerobic soil disinfestation, the better we get at using um, equipment versus people, the cheaper that will be. But in all of our trials, the um, increased yield compensated for the additional costs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, how did you apply molasses? We applied molasses with an, or, uh, the equivalent of a water truck that we just attached a boom to, calibrated it, and drove over top of our beds. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, are there any thoughts on specific crop rotations that work best with, I mean, I guess Francesco mentioned some of this, so specific crop rotations that work best with ASD. I know you're trying out different um, cover crop mixtures. Yes. So I don't know that there is like specific crop rotation. Like we have not done like work specifically with different crop rotation systems. For sure, there are some crops that um, may benefit more from the nutrition that is provided, you know, right after the application of the ASD compared to others. Uh, we have been working mainly like here in Pennsylvania with a, a, a lettuce tomato double crop system. And, you know, what we see is that there is enough nutrition after the ASD treatment to do the lettuce first over the winter months and then have a tomato crop without you know, fertilizing or really you have to fertilize a little bit the, the tomatoes um, you know, if it is a long uh, production season. Um, in, you know, one thing in terms of cropping system, what we are trying to study is also like the possibility to combine the use of cover crops with you know, vegetable crops. And that is something that 
uh, it really depends from um, you know the setup that each farm has and the time the the window of time available for cover crops um, what from the last studies we see that um, what we use as a cover crop is really you know important for the efficacy of ASD but also for the availability of you know nitrogen and other nutrients afterwards for the crop I don't know if that answered the question okay thank you um, let's see, we have a question here about whether there is any more environment friendly alternative to plastic mulch. I know you mentioned that you had tried a couple of biodegradable mulches, but you didn't get control of the nutsedge. Silage tarp is, is an excellent uh, approach, especially for smaller farms that, and even those that uh, don't do raised bed production, it works well on uh, flat to use the silage tarp. Yeah, because it's reusable. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, let's see, we've got Ian here, who is an organic grower in the UK. Has any work been done looking at allium white rot or brassica club root and ASD? Yes, uh, some of the European researchers have targeted both of those and have had good success. Okay, great. Um, let's see, what is the buckwheat doing for the soil microbes? Is it root exudates? No, what we think um, is happening there is that, you know, when we incorporate in the, in the, in the soil, the buckwheat is, is really fresh um, organic matter. And so there are sugars available uh, in there. We do, we try to incorporate the cover crops before they reach any stage of linification. Uh, and so it's, it's really like, you know, fresh organic matter that is used as a food source from the microbes to develop anaerobic conditions. Uh, now, you know, when we work with cover crops, we have a component of the sugar, the total carbon that is cellulose, and another component that is actual sugar, you know, soluble sugar. Uh, more cellulose and lignin we have less available that carbon will be and less effective the treatment will be. So that is the same reason why, for example, composted material are not as effective as fresh organic amendment for the application of the SD treatment. Okay, um, we have a question from Ben here asking, what commercialization potential do you see with this process? Well, I think they're ahead of us uh, in terms of their entrepreneurial spirits in California. So they actually have um, a company that will go around and source materials and apply ASD commercially. Mm -hmm. I wish that we had someone who would do that in Florida. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I will add that also in, in Europe, there is a couple of companies, one in the Netherlands and one in Italy that are proposing this technology. You know, they have maybe developed a, a carbon source mix that works um, and they are proposing that as a commercial solution. Hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Um, here's a question about why you don't use rice bran as is often used in California. Is that because we're you know, you're trying to find um, ingredients in each different region that are easy to yes. source and inexpensive. Yeah. yeah, so in Pennsylvania, we don't have rice production, but wheat midlinks is available. Okay, yeah, and we had a question about where you source wheat midlings and how much to apply per acre or per thousand square feet. Yes, yeah, so... Um, we, we buy uh, wheat midlings. I mean, there are different sources. There are, you know, wheat mills that are locally here uh, in Pennsylvania. And there are also like um, feed uh, stock um, stores that, that sell that type of uh, carbon source. Uh, in terms of application rate, um, usually we, we establish the application rate not based on like um, a specific amount of the carbon source itself, like as a product, we work with the total carbon and total nitrogen content, mainly with the total carbon um, content. And usually we are about 7,000 kilograms per hectare, 6,000 kilograms per hectare if we combine it with cover crops. Um, and that um, 
is like usually I will say around 13 megagrams, 13 um, you know European tons per hectare, and uh, a little bit less than 20 um, tons US tons per acre. It's around 15 something like that. Great, Thank but you. we can be more specific. I don't remember now all the numbers, but we. What I wanted to say is that we usually do the analysis of the carbon source and based on the total carbon and total nitrogen content, we define how much we are going to apply. Okay, great. Um, let's see, will ASD be soil type specific and the farther north you go, will it be less effective because of temperatures? Erin, do you want to answer that and then I say more? Sure. Um... What was the first part of the question? Okay, the first part was, is it soil type specific? I guess, does it make a difference what kind of soil you have? It does, but probably mostly from the soil saturation perspective. Florida is, where we work is beach sand. And really, in many other places, there's the potential to use less water because we lose water as quickly as we gain it. Francesco? Yeah, my, my experience is, you know, after working in Florida with very sandy soils and then, you know, working in Pennsylvania with aviar soil is that um, the, the application itself is easier in sandy soil. Um, Avi soil, um, you know, it's easy to achieve anaerobic condition even just applying water. But the, the effect that we see are kind of long lasting. Like, you know, there's like, a longer effect and sometimes that can affect the follow-up crop or the availability of nitrogen. So defining the amount of water, the amount of carbon source that we apply, it will be different from soil to soil. And you know, the second part of the question was about the temperature. What we see is that for specific pathogens at best, you know, temperature is important for the efficacy of you know, a control. And um, some of them require high temperature than others. Um, the efficacy, you know, may be reduced because of like lower temperature. Like if we go below that 15 Celsius, we clearly see a reduction of the microbial activity and so a reduction of the efficacy. But um, if we are, you know, close to 15 or, you know, slightly above, then we are fine. We can. Uh, tweak a little bit the carbon application rate so that we have kind of the same efficacy that we may have in a, um, in a warmer environment. Now, there is a lot of research still that needs to be done on, you know, the right carbon source that can allow to control, let's say something like macrofomina that Dr. Aaron Roscoff mentioned is kind of challenging and requires higher temperatures. Okay, the questions are pouring in here. Let's see. Um, is a four mill millimeter thickness enough for the silage tarp? That's what we used. We used a four and a six and got good results from both. Okay, and um, was there a reduction percentage available with ASD for yellow nut sedge and other weeds? Well, grassy weeds that come through the planting hole, we had complete control. Broadleaf weeds through the planting hole, complete control. The, uh, the more successful the application of ASD, the less nut sedge we have. And in some cases, when we get a good application, um, we get complete control of nut sedge, and sometimes we don't. And that really is dependent upon the water portion. Okay, um, let's see. Considering that the soil microbiome is compounded with harmful and useful microorganisms, is there no impact of the ASD on the useful soil microorganisms? And if so, is there a way to solve that? So we joke sometimes about how we're selectively feeding organisms in this system, because essentially what you're doing is favoring the facultative anaerobes by saturating that soil when the carbon source is available. And the, plant, and the pathogens typically are obligate uh, aerobes. 
So when you are really selecting from the beginning of the, the uh, application for the facultative anaerobes, and you would be surprised at how many of those um, facultative anaerobes are actually our commercial biological control agents. It's it, that is the group that we often select antimicrobials from. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Manisha here asked to assess soil nutrient dynamics. Do you take soil samples during ASD treatment? And if yes, how is that possible without altering the anaerobic conditions of the soil? We have this discussion quite yeah. a lot as well. We yeah, I mean, we got specialized in taking soil sample and taping, sealing the, the hole right after um, we, 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 we punched the holes. I mean, uh, a little hole that is, you know, uncovered for a few minutes is not going to change much. And the other thing that we try to do is to work with, when possible, with larger plots so that, you know, there's not much of an interference from that. There could be, you know, an interference but what we our data show that you know we really see the dynamics and that soil sampling done even one two days after the treatment is not affecting the development of anaerobic conditions okay um let's see ben here says that in michigan plastic beds are laid when soil moisture conditions permit in the spring but may not be planted for several weeks to hit later markets. How could I learn if this is enough temperature or time to accomplish ASD? Could a degree day model be adapted using soil temperatures to determine if there's enough relevant heat accumulation? We don't have that, but that's an excellent suggestion and I'm writing it down now. <laughs> <laughs> How great. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks, Ben. Yeah, you know, sometimes like what we see is that the, the weather is variable and, you know, um, like to define if that week you're going to have, you know, sometimes we, we do all the plan and then the week we apply the SD, the temperature goes down all of a sudden, especially here, you know, in the fall. And, um, but whenever we have mulch, like the, the film that is helping to increase the temperature and is enough to have like a few days of warm, you know, sunny days that, you know, the soil will warm up. If we have an eye tunnel, then, you know, that will help also to buffer the, the temperature, you know, the, the, the variation of temperature that you may have outside. Um, so I don't know if this answered the question, but, you know, we, we consider that critical 15 Celsius degree or 60 Fahrenheit um, as, you know, a critical temperature for microbial activity. Okay, yeah, um, we have a question here from Ali, who I know is based in North Africa. And he says, for large areas, it's not easy, especially for cereal crops. We have problems with nematodes, wireworms, whiteworms that go deep in the soil, more than 50 centimeters, and some diseases. I guess that's a comment rather than a question, but if you have anything to say about that. Yeah, well, I will say, go ahead, go ahead. We've been focused on um, high value specialty crops. We have not considered applications in cereal crops, but I do think there's a benefit to using something like sun hemp mm -hmm. as a rotation, especially since that seed is pretty valuable. All of our uh, growers in Florida, whether they're conventional or organic are very much interested in using sun hemp as a cover crop. Okay, I know Aaron has to go pretty soon, so I'm going to just ask one more question here. Um, let's see, is there a maximum temperature limit for the efficacy of ASD? Practically no. speaking, I think that there is not a limit. I mean, uh, the, you know, whatever happens in nature, I mean, it, the soil cannot get hot over a certain, you know, threshold. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I think um, we're out of time here, but um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to contact us. And um, we really appreciate all the questions that were submitted and the active discussion. And thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for joining us today.